let's welcome Armin Saidi, the co-founder of Whitecaster. Hello. 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 <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hello. So, uh, can you please tell about uh, about, uh, about your childhood, about your roots, which is very interesting for us? Absolutely. A great and way to start, I guess. Yeah. Sorry? I said a great way to start. Yeah, sure. Let's start. <laughs> so, uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Armin Saidi. I am um, Armenian, Iranian, born and raised in French Canada, in Montreal. So I spent most of my life uh, in Montreal. Uh, I come from a small village outside of, uh, actually, outside of Montreal, and eventually we came uh, to Montreal. Um, grew up more in a Persian house than Armenian, if anything. But uh, it wasn't until uh, I got to Yerevan that I realized how Armenian I really was. So uh, it's been quite an interesting discovery here. And um, everything about my childhood, uh, I think uh, regular childhood filled with love and happiness, etc. Uh, but I was a um, combination of constantly in the hospital because I was a very curious person and I got myself into trouble all the time. But that curious nature brought me to eventually become an entrepreneur, uh, trying to build software, hardware, and build things. This is what I'm all about. Did you have this curiosity of devices in your childhood? Uh, absolutely. Um, my poor parents, uh, especially my father, um, they used to buy all sorts of things, stereos, uh, toaster, etc. And before you knew it, before even they opened it or used it, I had stuck my... My, my hands into it, took the screwdriver and started opening things and trying to discover how they worked, but the reality was how can I break something was more the, what I was doing. Um, I always enjoyed these things. It was in front of me. Uh, my father had given me a little uh, kit uh, for hardware, uh, not hardware, um, carpenter kit that had screwdriver, hammer, all sorts of things. And he used to do a lot of things himself as well, so I tried to mimic him. Uh, but by not creating something, taking something that existed and somehow breaking it. <laughs> what, what is the background of your father? My father is a retired orthopedic surgeon. So he's a carpenter for the human body and working on bones. Um, I used to actually look at videos and films of his operations and very fascinated as a child that you can do these types of things. So I <laughs> realized that my body could be... Uh, um, go through a lot of things and that's why I said I kept on going to the hospital because uh, I just kept on being a mini disaster um, accident happening all the time um, bicycle skateboard whatever and to the point where the the hospital where my father worked knew me like I would somehow end up at the hospital and everyone would say hey Armin how are you what happened this time actually as uh, many entrepreneurs entrepreneurs uh, had their very first steps in entrepreneurship on their 10, 12, 30 age. Uh, how was that about you? Um, I had something very similar <laughs> as well. So, when, when did you start? I, the first time that I... Uh, entrepreneurship started very early, around uh, 11, 12 years old. Um, where we used to live was across from a golf course um, and there was a big fence, and all the balls that would come on the other side of the fence, uh, with my friends, we would go and gather them. Um, my friends would keep them, but I would clean them and make them shiny, and then go in front of uh, the golf course and try to sell them back. So I started with one or two, and I realized that just to encourage a young person, people were buying them, uh, and I became a bit more entrepreneurial. So I had built a stand, I had different categories of balls, so from the... 25 cent ones to 50 cents to a dollar, depending on how clean they were. Okay. <laughs> Very interesting. So, uh, actually, uh, what is your background and where have you studied? What university or universities? Yeah, universities, actually. So, um, I studied international business and finance uh, in Montreal. Uh, I went to two universities. One of them was the Université de Montréal, one of the French-speaking uh, universities we have and then 
The other one is a business school called the John Molson School of Business, uh, where I got my degree in international business uh, with a minor in marketing and also uh, finance eventually. And um, yeah, the, I think during those times is where um, I was very fortunate enough to have a combination of um, great people around me and teachers. And that same university, and I'm, I'm sure we'll get to it uh, eventually, is where I, ev I ended up meeting one of my business partners that I have today. Uh, the co-founder of? The, one of the co-founders of Wycaster, absolutely. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, he's the, he was the lecturer or the student? No. Um, Maybe we're fast forwarding a bit, but um, at one point in my career, I wanted to build hardware. This was about 15, 16, 20 years ago, and uh, I had no clue what needed to be done. So someone recommended that I go to the uh, engineering department at the university and try to find someone that could potentially help. So I went to go see a professor. A uh, professor looked at the prospectus of what I wanted to do and uh, recommended a few people and as I was going through the hallway trying to find uh, uh, these students I end up in front of an audio-visual uh, association and I asked a question and the person there curious to ask me why do you want to talk to these people I explained to them and he just looked at me and goes you know what forget them they're not going to be able to help you and I guarantee you're going to come back to me and I just looked at him and I said okay whatever so I did go see the others, sat down with them, and they were very smart people, but uh, master degree, very focused on what they were doing, and they were questioning what I wanted to do. And it wasn't, I was trying to say, I'll pay you, just do it, can you do it? And at the end, it uh, didn't work out, and I went back to go see this person, and he happens to be Sharat, uh, one of my co-founders of Wycaster, so we started the relationship like this. Uh, over 10 years ago, and we did a lot of work together to eventually start this company. That's great. Did you have any, besides uh, getting a partner in this engineering, did you have any mentors, advisors? Because most of universities actually, for some and entrepreneurs, give this impact and uh, with mentorship. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so during university, there was a combination of the teachers that we had. Some were acad academic teachers, uh, and the other ones were business people that were uh, there to teach and share their experience. And I was very fortunate to have one of these teachers. There was two, actually, but one in particular, Professor Dewan, uh, who taught uh, international business um, cross-cultural communications. And uh, he was one of my first real mentor within my scope of entrepreneurship. And um, he just had a very interesting vision of how to deal with people, and I learned a lot from him. Um, it, it was just a question of, he kept on saying, networking is key, and the other thing that he kept on saying, just do things. You, you don't know what's gonna happen, but just do things, and hopefully it will achieve in the right direction. As, as you said when we first met, uh, don't afraid to do think, not try think. Yeah, um, so <laughs> for those of you that know the movie Star Wars, uh, there's a very well-known quote, uh, do or do not, there is no try. And this is something that I believe in the deep of my, my soul, my bones, etc. You'll never know if you don't actually do it. And it's not a question of trying. You need to go and do it or just don't bother. And this is um, what I learned from him and other people as well. Uh, but the idea is if you think about something, nothing's going to happen unless you get out there and do things. And I think that the best quote, or not quote, but look at the um, Nike shoes uh, tagline, just do it. Three simple, very powerful words that I think every one of us should put in their lives for anything that they do, whether it's family, business, work, school. Exactly. Exactly. Please tell us about uh, how you have built your career path. And then we'll come back to the Wycaster and other businesses. So my, my career path, like everything else that I've done, um, has been, in my opinion, very interesting. I would never go for a job that I knew I could do well. I usually went for something that I had nothing associated to it or I didn't do anything because I would get bored very fast. Uh, my attention span was very limited so I needed to be in a situation where I had to learn and be on my own to do things. 
So the first job I had straight out of university was as a salesperson um, selling health and safety equipment. Uh, so, you know, you're excited, you just graduated from school, you have a good job. I didn't realize what it would entail, but eventually um, my responsibility within this health and safety equipment was selling toilet paper and toilet paper for industries. And after a while, I sort of got disappointed saying to myself, I didn't go to university to do this. So um, throughout my, my path there, uh, I must have resigned about five times. But I was luckily very good at selling this toilet paper. So every time I, I kept on resigning, they would hire me back with a bonus. Five and times from five the times. same company. Same company, <laughs> five times. And it wasn't a strategic move. It was just, I don't like what I'm doing. But the money was good. Um, out of university, I was making a very good salary. Uh, very fortunate to be able to do this. Uh, but just the type of products that I was selling was not exciting at all. And the industry was just dry. And um, I remember the first time they sent me, so it's health and safety products. So think of hats, gloves, uh, earplugs. And um, my boss, after one week, said, Armin, we're going to send you on a business trip. So in my mind, I imagine you know, going somewhere far, taking a plane, something exciting, having a per diem, enjoying, etc. So it was um, Toronto, which is um, not too far from Montreal. So, okay, let's go to Toronto. Um, it was a business trip that was organized by one of our suppliers. And it was four days of training. And just to give you an example, one day in full, it was 12 hours, full day of how to sell earplugs. And we're talking about those little yellow, orange things that you put in your ear. And I could not take it. I was going crazy falling asleep during the, the, the specialist telling us what to do, what not. And I used to have a, one of those sharp pencils and I used to poke myself to keep me up and just to, you know, it was the first um, business trip I had and I wanted at least my superior to be uh, proud of, of what I had done. But it was a nightmare for four days of just, especially that one day, earplugs. How, I, 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 <laughs> I can't even explain it. But I knew every technique to sell earplugs. Yeah, as, as actually the, the first question to marketers or salesperson, they are asking, can you sell this pen? You can sell plugins. <laughs> <laughs> OK, what was your uh, role in Tedrox? The company was named Tedrox, yeah? OK, so after this, uh, how do I say, fantastic, exciting career selling all these wonderful uh, products. I took about a year off. So after the fifth time that I resigned, they actually just let me go. I took some time off, uh, traveled. Uh, I was fortunate I had done a lot of money um, as a salesman uh, under commission. So I had a bit of leeway to take some time. And eventually I ended up in this company called Ten Rocks. And this was um, around 1997, 1998, where the dot-com boom was starting. Um, and these guys sold timesheets, expense sheet, eventually project management. And I was the sixth or seventh employee. And um, I was hired to be assistant in marketing. And uh, this, is what I, this is where my, it was the first time that I actually got involved in a tech company. So prior to that, my knowledge of tech was very limited. Um, I don't think I had used a computer before that. Uh, Word documents, etc., or back then was word perfect. Um, I used to have my friends or my girlfriend type my papers for university. I, I didn't know how to use a computer. So this was um, baptism by fire, and you're in, and suddenly in a very exciting domain, within five years, the company reached $15 million of revenue. We were 150 employees. So that's where I got the sort of the, um, the bug for the startup world. Uh, very fun and exciting. Okay, and uh, what was actually your first experience in doing business? I know you are a fan of music, you are passionate music, and it was a music business, correct? Yeah, so, um, I, well, if we step back, uh, after my uh, another exciting career selling golf balls, eventually, throughout my life, I've had businesses. So nothing really serious, but I always had certain types of businesses, so I've sold t-shirts. I used to have a printing company. My goal was always to make money to be able to travel in the summer. 
So this is what I did, and to be also be able to live comfortably during the year if possible. But the real business that, uh, or my own real business was soon after this 10 Rocks company. So um, I had left um, and I took some time off again. I was in a situation that I, I was uh, comfortable enough to take about uh, eight months to 10 months without doing anything. So I tried to figure out what I wanted to do. And I had a passion for technology and a passion for music and I was trying to see how I can combine both of them. So. Um, yeah, I started talking with musicians and producers that I knew, and there was a clear path of, you know, a niche market I can go is artists didn't know, and to this day, I don't think they know much, but they didn't know how to promote themselves at all, and this is in the early days of social media. So back then, it was MySpace, and these wonderful tools existed, but no one knew how to use them. So I wanted to go into that business and see what we can do. But before that, I remember we were talking about that you bought a house and you equipped oh. it with the music equipment and yeah, it is somehow got into news, your house. <laughs> okay, so when I resigned the fifth time uh, from that health and safety company, uh, the last day of work I had my suitcase and the office was near the airport and I was about to go to Europe for a few weeks with my friends and we ended up in Ibiza. Uh, and that's where I discovered house music and electronic music. Anyhow, I, I sort of became passionate for it. I came back and um, I wanted to become a DJ. So this was uh, 1998, 1999. Uh, no clue what to do again. It's exciting, it's fun. Uh, but I let go of that, started working for the software company. And then when I left that software company, um, came back to the DJing uh, and I needed to find a home where I can actually uh, play loud music. So luckily I found a property, it was an old nightclub uh, that was not being used. Um, I had a bit of money, I made an offer, I bought it and I turned it into apartments, but I was able to um, play very loud music. So that, that actually started the real first entrepreneurship where I saw an empty space. It was about this big, but the previous owner of this um, nightclub, I don't know what they decided to do, but they ripped off everything. There, were, there was nothing. It was a pure nightmare. Uh, when I walked in, I went in the middle of the room, I had a big smile on, and the agent was looking at me saying, why are you smiling? And I told him, I love this space, this is beautiful. And I could already see all the different things and the, uh, what I wanted to do um, in the place. I even ended up doing the drawings myself, uh, bringing it to an architect to have it uh, uh, approved. And once more, not being able to go buy a house or an apartment that was ready-made, I had to get into a situation that I needed to build something. And lucky enough, I found the right people They helped me do this. And this started a small little business on the side that still exists, that is a real estate company that I have back home. Um, I have a partner in there and we have a few properties that we rent out and sometimes we buy and sell. Uh, I haven't done much of that lately, but uh, that's where really the entrepreneurship started and then led to this music business. And you are now partnering in real estate agent, uh, agency as well? As well? Pardon? The partner of a real estate that's agency? That's it. Uh, well, okay. real estate agent, no. It's a, it's a real estate company, so we own a few okay. properties and we rent and uh, so on and so forth, but... Uh, Actually, my background is also from real estate and <laughs> then I came <laughs> to tech industry. Okay, and what is before Vinyl? You have been promoting, uh, actually I know, as a salesperson of some uh, USB stuff and... Okay. Yeah? Okay, so before... Um, actually, tell us how you came to Vinyl. Yeah, Vinyl, yeah, please. yeah. So, um, when I was mentioning earlier how uh, I had a passion for music and technology and I was trying to find how to make this work and earn a living. Uh, I realized that the promotional side of the music industry was unknown. So, or very limited. So I was good at marketing and I said to myself, let's try to find different ways to help artists. So we started this, or when I say we, um, I started a consulting company, a company called Nekin, uh, Nekin Technologies. Uh, and uh, the idea was a consultancy to help artists promote themselves. And we started, I started hiring people, we got some contracts, we started uh, working with some um, musicians uh, and producers, and we did good work. And throughout the work, I started realizing a few 
things that were missing and also having ideas. And one of the ideas was this um, promotional tool that was going to be a um, disposable MP3 player. And this is before the iPod shuffle, so something very affordable. You could put two, three songs in it, distribute them uh, at events, um, and then people would connect that USB key and the whole thing would appear on your computer, like a virtual album type of thing. So this is what I wanted to do that led to this uh, MP3 player that I eventually went to the university to find someone to build it, and that's when I met Sharat. Okay, to this engineering university. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so we built the prototype. Again, I had no clue, hardware. Um, I'm a marketing salesperson. But I had a vision, I had someone do designs, uh, marketing designs. I brought it to some people. Sharat, my now partner, was the one that eventually built it. We came up with the product, packaging, everything was ready. And then one day, um, Steve Jobs announces the iPod shuffle. And then our dreams of beautiful hardware within the music industry just went down because there was no one that wanted a disposable MP3 player. So I learned a lot, but the interesting part is that disposable MP3 player, I would have to say, is version zero of, or 0 0.1 of Wycaster, the hardware that we build now. Yeah. And uh, we'll come to Wycaster. What about vinyl? OK. Uh, so well, actually, let me say, uh, you are, you're not a techie guy. But you have two companies, uh, one a software company, vinyl, uh, that we'll talk about, and Wycaster. So, how you actually do that? This is more about vision, more about sales personality, say being a salesperson or mar marketing person. It's, what, I think what, it's more of a, a question of, uh, I, I'm good at putting things together. Uh, meaning, um, I'll give you an example. Um, if I read books, I don't read one book, I'll have maybe four or five books at the same time, and I won't read from chapter one till the end, I'll read what's interesting. And luckily enough, sometimes, Chapter four relates to chapter five or 10 of another book, and then ideas come to mind. So I'm very good at visually thinking of putting combinations of things together, and then I find even better at getting things done and finding the people to help me getting things done. So I'm not an engineer, I'm not a programmer, I'm a sales marketing person that understands technology extremely well uh, and just has a drive to do things. So that's how somehow uh, that little child when it was five playing with hardware that ended up building hardware some 30, 40 years later. Hardware and software. Hardware like and software, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And what about vinyl? How did you come to, to it? So vinyl, okay, so just to let everyone know, vinyl um, was a promotional tool, still exists. It's um, a content management system, a CMS that allows you to build a website for each song that you have or each video. So the concept was super simple. It's a landing page. We all use these today. It was what I was using myself at the company Ten Rocks to promote their project management tool. So I realized that why not um, use the same principles in regular businesses, enterprise, to help artists promote themselves. So we started doing these um, contracts for people with simple one-pagers that had beautiful design, a bit of information, a song to download or a video to view, but the downloads were always an exchange of content, so an email, phone number, whatever. We wanted to uh, get something so the artist could eventually go promote uh, directly to the, um, to the fan. And um, this vinyl concept was also the software part of the disposable MP3 player. So we had a failure because we couldn't go to market with that product, but there was something within all of that that could be salvaged and then used, uh, and was a concept that eventually became a product. And um, this product was actually built by someone who eventually became my other co-founder in Wycaster. So for those of you who've met David, um, one day I get an email from someone saying, there's this guy from France you should meet. Uh, he's, he's looking for work. So I sat down with him, I told him, what I wanted to do, and he told me, I just discovered how to code, but I'm willing to learn. Um, I don't want a salary, just get me food, <laughs> and I'll do things for you. And we started with this, and the relationship started as well, and he, like me, was very curious and would learn and just 
Today is, I think, one of the most uh, smartest CTOs I've met. Not only does he do hardware, software, market, every, everything put together. So this is how I ended up meeting uh, David. And um, through conversations with him, we said that this little one-page concept could potentially be a product. So we sat down, we did the schematics for it, we built it, and at the end of 2010, we sort of launched a beta. Um, this was around Christmas time. I went on holiday. I was sitting in a plane for eight hours. I land. Uh, I was on my way to Paris with my girlfriend back then. I land. I get Wi-Fi connectivity, and suddenly I see thousands of emails in my um, inbox. And these were all artists that had registered. And what had happened is, over the time that I had gone on a flight, someone from the music industry had found vinyl, wrote a phenomenal article about it, and that article led to, I'd say, in a matter of weeks, to maybe 50 other articles. And within two weeks, we had over 10,000 registrations of our, uh, to our better product that was barely functioning. So Dave Wood was constantly in the back end pressing buttons to make sure things worked. Uh, I had to manually, for these 10,000 people that we had, manually, one by one, send them their registration confirmation and password. And, but this started something very interesting. So we, we had no clue what we had gotten involved in, uh, but the media took over. So this was um, end of December 2010. By 2011, January, we were known as one of the hottest or the 10 hardest music startups in the world. Uh, being invited to all these conferences uh, with all these well-known entrepreneurs and business people in the music industry. And here I am sitting down and they asked my opinion on how you see the future of the music industry. It was just like surreal. I, I couldn't believe it. So anyhow, it's quite interesting. Um, we were being offered money. There was attraction beyond what we expected. This is one of those situations that um, even to this day, vinyl exists. I have a small team that is in charge of it. We've never updated the software. Uh, this has been six years. Um, we built a second version that we never had time to launch because Ycaster started. And back then, there were also investors who were very interested in investing in us. Uh, unlike today, that I have to run after money and convince people, back then it was being sort of thrown at us. Um, we were about to close around, but then that's when we started having the ideas for Ycaster. And um, we let go of vinyl and we said, you know what, I think we can do something much better with Ycaster. Okay, uh, just to understand that, how, how did uh, vinyl work? The simplicity of the solution, I, yeah. I would so, like yeah, to understand um, this. Actually, yeah, very good question. So the article that the person wrote was the fact that within 30 seconds, they were able to build a website. And it was ready to be promoted online. So uh, nothing complicated. You were created a, uh, you didn't, we didn't even want you to create an account. It was, we just wanted your name, artist name, you put a, a, an image for the background, you uploaded your song, and within 30 seconds, boom, 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 your site was up and you had um, a short URL that you can use to promote. So I think it was the simplicity of it. And um, building a website is something complicated. And back then it was very expensive too. So I used to charge for those one little website up to four or $5,000 back then to the music industry. So suddenly we had automated the process and it would take 30 seconds, and I actually felt guilty. I can't charge $5,000 anymore for this. So it yeah. was a free service we had given, and we were going to figure out a, a business model on the second platform that we never launched. Uh, they were, if I understand correct, uploading the music, and uh, did you have any pirate dilemma there, or how the music or the oh, yeah, my song, God. The, um, the, the, the album, what was uploading? So there was an issue, a combination of things. Um, we started receiving letters from lawyers because of copyrighted material. Um, uh, this is free for all. The music industry has gone through hell and they were trying to just go after anyone that did something right or wrong. And um, interestingly enough, this business was also inspired, you just mentioned something, um, by a book that I read called Pirate's Dilemma. And the book was about uh, how the youth culture through pirating and all sorts of things will beat the corporates. And um, this is actually part of a certain chapter. 
uh, and we applied some of the principles in that book. And the principle was, if you're about to fight piracy, don't fight it, compete with it. So instead of fighting and trying to take down people that have websites, try to find a way to take advantage of this concept that music is just being distributed. Like artists that were unknown were somehow sometimes being listened by millions of people. But the problem was the artist didn't know who those million people were. So the concept for us was if someone's about to pirate your music, let them do it, but in exchange, try to get information from them so you can eventually market to them. Okay, great idea, I think. Okay, let's come to Wycaster. How did you come to this idea and how did the co-founder, actually the, the guy from Engineering University, help you? Okay, so... Um, what was the solution, first solution, version 001? 001, <laughs> so um, Wycaster was inspired with a couple of things. The first one is again that Pirate's Dilemma book that I mentioned. There's a chapter um, that talks about, um, in, in the 60s, uh, in the UK, rock and pop music was illegal. Um, you couldn't play it in radio, so it was called devil's music. So intelligent entrepreneurs went into international waters with what they used to call these pirate ships, and from there would broadcast the AM, FM uh, broadcasting, and people would tune in with the radio. So when I read that, I started having ideas. There was nothing going on, but just, it was like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, because uh, I started making a comparison, as we have our cell phones, um, there's Wi-Fi being broadcasted all over the place, so you can connect to it easily. So I was trying to see if there was something there. And then the uh, second... Excuse me, what year it was? Sorry? Uh, what was the year? Uh, 2000? Uh, this was uh, around 2009, 2010. So okay. when I was building vinyl and about to launch it, so this was when I was reading the book and these ideas were okay. just crossing my mind, but there was nothing concrete, uh, okay. etc. And then following that, there was the unfortunate situation in Iran that happened, so the, um, the Green Revolution, where the um, whole um, government had shut down the networks and people were left with devices that couldn't communicate with each other. So at that point, uh, I was sitting down with David uh, having coffee somewhere. So David is one of my co-founders. And we said to ourselves, could we build some sort of technology that would allow people to uh, connect to each other, uh, still using their smart devices in case of network shutdown? So this was just conversation. And then I started thinking of the, those pirate ships that were being uh, leveraged in the, in the UK, et cetera. And over time, we started talking. and. David had an idea, and uh, he told me, go buy these things, and I'll try to build a prototype. And uh, we did, and um, there was no real idea of doing a business around this. This was more, could we build a product that would allow uh, people to save their lives? And th there was no business behind it. It was just, you know, can we save lives? Do I understand correct? Uh, to create something that will uh, create a network. That's right, platform. that's right. So the idea was if the networks are shut down, whether it's deliberate by a government for whatever reason it is, or uh, worse yet, um, a natural disaster, uh, you still need to be able to communicate to people and let them know what's going on, etc. So the idea was could we create these local networks that would allow people to have access to content or even communication means to save lives or at least know where to go for help. So this was the initial like, concept, nothing more. Uh, so we had discussions for this for a few months and then again David, my partner, said buy these elements and I think I can come up with something. And keeping in mind that David is not the hardware engineer in our team, he's the software guy. So David was the one that built uh, the first prototype and he called me over and I went to his house and I see this big box with all these electronic things, lights blinking, etc., and he goes, this is it, it works. So we started playing around with it. So I created a local network, Wi-Fi. I took my computer and I connected to it and suddenly I had access to a web page. and David <clears throat> had put some music and some videos and I was able to stream it and I went outside and I was still able to stream it, so it was exciting. So we had something that uh, mimicked the internet, but it wasn't the internet. Um, and then following that, we did a test for about a month. David, uh, the neighborhood where David lived, it was a cool little neighborhood with coffee shops, etc. So 
in the coffee shops, we would have access to this network. So we did a test. We said, let's leave this on for about a month. We put some e-books, some music, uh, songs. We put some videos, some movies, etc. And we said, let's see what happens. Are people even going to be interested in connecting or not? So again, coming back to the concept of just doing, right? We, we did this. And a month later, there was about 200 people that had uh, connected. And when they would connect, there was a page that said, welcome. This is not the internet, but we have content. Please enjoy. And there was a feedback part. So people would leave feedback. And there was positive comments. So we said to ourselves, OK, maybe we're onto something. Uh, and what is Ycaster now through these five, six years? Oh. Seven years, actually. Um, so Ycaster is officially a content distribution platform uh, focusing on uh, telcos, transport, retailers. And the idea is we make it easy for anyone, practically, to create wireless networks, but more importantly, to provide content and services at the network edge. So the initial idea is more or less the same. But we don't only create offline networks. We actually do a bit of both. So you can have internet with local content. You can have local content or uh, both combined. And um, what's interestingly happening right now is the, there's a transformation. There's a massive disruption right now going on in cloud. And the cloud is being divided. Um, and they're calling this edge computing. So for a variety of reasons within um, IoT, um, congestion because we're using too much data, et cetera. The cloud is not sufficient enough to support the demand that we have today, and they need something closer to the end user. So when we started Ycaster, we had different names for it. We used to call it uh, local marketing, hyper-local content distribution, et cetera, et cetera. But it wasn't until maybe eight months ago that the industry started talking about edge computing. and this is what we do. And suddenly, we're like, wow, three years later, there's a name for it. And um, when we speak to investors and partners, they can relate to it. It was a much more difficult concept to explain to people because you have the internet, then you have Ycaster. And most people said, why are you even bothering when the internet exists? Yeah, OK. And uh, did you, I know that you have already participated in acceler uh, an accelerator, and you did your demo, and you have somehow raised money for Ycaster. Can you explain us? Yeah, Let so us um, one of those situations late at night, uh, actually, I'll step back. So vinyl is going on. We're sitting down with investors. We're about to raise money. Um, but Ycaster was on the back of my mind, and I kept on wondering, am I making a mistake? And every time I sat down with the investors, I wanted to tell them about Ycaster. So for um, entrepreneurs out there, uh, don't talk about multiple products. Just focus on one, because it doesn't work. So um, and, and sitting down with the investors, I, I wasn't able to fully give myself to the vinyl concept, because Ycaster was kept on going in the back of my mind. Um, I hired someone at one point to do some market research on the ideas that we had. Uh, within a month, this girl came up with some results, which looked, interestingly enough, similar to what is going on in the industry now, so this whole edge computing thing. So it wasn't called edge computing, but it was something similar to it. So I went back to both Sharat and David, who were working with me on this side project, and I presented them the, this uh, finding, and I said, I think there's something big that's going to happen uh, in the next few years. Um, I'm willing to let go of vinyl completely. So at that point, David used to be an employee of vinyl. So I looked at him. I go, what do, you, what do you say? He goes, I'm behind you. Let's go for it. And Sharat also at that point had a hardware company, a uh, quite successful one. They were making millions of dollars. And he was very intrigued by this, and he said, I'm in. So he sold his shares to his company. And um, so this is around November 2012. December 2012, late at night, I read an article on TechCrunch about this IoT incubator, that it's the first one in Europe, or actually the first IoT incubator. Um, and I registered, and we got accepted. So this uh, provided us with the mentorship we needed, with a bit of funding. It was in the UK, in Cambridge, where um, 
if any of you know, Cambridge is very well known for a lot of, uh, so Cambridge in the UK, very well known for innovation in wireless or connectivity. So we were surrounded with the right people. Uh, from Saturday when we met, I'm thinking of how much were the valuation of vinyl when you exit just. The valuation of vinyl when you exit, when you sell the vinyl. Vinyl or yeah. Whitecaster? Vinyl. I, I never vinyl. sold it. Uh, you didn't sell no, it? No, no, no. Um, it still exists. Vinyl still exists. Okay. Uh, Sherat sold his company. Ah, so, no, vinyl still exists. Um, throughout the year that I started, or the years that we were starting Whitecaster, vinyl went through two potential acquisitions, and both of them. Uh, they were interesting in numbers, but they had to come with me as in the team. So, and I was not willing to go uh, for it. And uh, I would have to dedicate my life for this music industry. And uh, I think that the, I love the music industry, uh, fascinating realm, but it, it's just too much going on there. And Whitecaster is even more interesting. So, no, I never sold it. It would have been nice to, and I would not have uh, had to run after <laughs> investment oh, okay. on the Whitecaster, <laughs> but. Uh, no, didn't happen. Okay, and what about uh, Vicaster? Did you raise money on that? Absolutely. So we started with the uh, incubator, so Techstars in the UK. Uh, through Techstars, we ended up meeting uh, Yervan from um, uh, Granatus Ventures. So he was their London guy. Uh, we had discussions with them for some months. Eventually met the rest of the team, Ashot, uh, Manuk, uh, Pierre, etc. Uh, and they invited us to come to Armenia to see, well, they wanted to meet us, obviously, but they also wanted to show us the tech ecosystem in Armenia. I had never been to Armenia. Uh, David didn't know anything about Armenia. He only knew that I was part Armenian. So we ended up coming here. Uh, we had four days, um, and they took us everywhere, and we started seeing... Um, Something exciting, the tech ecosystem was brewing, uh, and while we were here, Granatus gave us a term sheet. Uh, we went back and eventually we closed around with them, so they were a lead investor. And as part of that um, agreement was to come and open a development center in Armenia. So two years later, two and a half years later, we have 14 people here, 14, 15 people working for us. Uh, and it was a very positive move to come. It was, again, one of those things that, uh, it was a, a bit of a risk. We were only the three founders at that point. We still didn't have a product. We would come to a country that we didn't know much. We didn't know what to expect. Uh, it was much more difficult than we thought, uh, but it paid off. Okay, what was uh, the main thing, actually, to come to Armenia? The Smart people, the ecosystem, the... A combination of things. I think um, we were driven around to many places, so Microsoft Innovation Center, we met a lot of interesting entrepreneurs. Uh, so we immediately saw that something was happening. The second thing was the amount of smart people we met and um, that not necessarily understood what we were doing, but had a passion for it. Uh, it was interesting, um, and just I think that the intelligent level in this country is just phenomenal. So that is no talk about it. Uh, while we were here, there was also, and this was fun. I think this was, uh, I think the most successful business trip I've ever had. We came here. They tell us there's um, uh, a grant innovation fund by EIF. We pitch. We end up being one of the lucky winners. Uh, so we had money from that as well. And then, um, of course, uh, the low wages of the country help tremendously with the amount of money we raise. So it just allows you to extend your runway. And the other thing that we liked was uh, Armenia was going to give us an opportunity to test a lot of our technologies. So there was a variety of things that were very positive, but there was a big unknown for us. And there was an unknown for some of our uh, other investors that wanted to commit money. They, it's unfortunate uh, they don't know about the market, they associate it with risk. And a lot of times investors want their, their uh, investments or their teams to be close to them. So having a team across the world in an area that is unknown to them is not their favorite thing. 
Got it. Not w what is the structure of your company? What are you doing here? Actually, the R and D or the manufacturing of the box uh, and the boxes are, I think, already small one and not that big one. They're, they're, yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> Ycaster is a UK-based company. Uh, we now have uh, a subsidiary in Armenia that is our R and D center. Majority of our employees are here. We recently opened in a, a Berlin office. Uh, we're working very closely with um, Deutsche Telekom, so we're in their offices. There's a few projects that uh, we're dealing with them. So the hardware right now is being partially designed here and in Montreal. So that's where Sherat is. Uh, Sherat has a family that's involved in um, manufacturing, so it's being manufactured in Montreal for now. But the idea is to eventually go to Asia and potentially bring um, assembly initially to Armenia, if we can. And if we can even take uh, manufacturing, we'll come here. And 100% of the software is being built here. And now the office in Berlin will be our sales and operations and marketing office. So um, I've spent in the past few years maybe 80% of my time in Armenia and the rest in Europe. And slowly but surely, I'm going to be doing a switch. So um, unfortunately, I'll be here less. But we now have a product that we can sell. And you can't really sell in the European market from here, at least not our type of product. So it's not a, an app or software you can download. This is something that you have to go meet people. And for further investment, raise and partners, et cetera, you, you have to be present in the local areas to meet people. You could be sitting somewhere at a coffee shop. Next thing you know, uh, someone introduces you to someone that knows someone that knows someone. And this is where business happens. And the longer you or I would stay here, the less business production or advancement we would have. OK, so your next step, something like to make local sales and local? Uh, absolutely. So. There, there are some opportunities for us to sell in Armenia. So there's a bunch of projects that we've done. We're discussing with a lot of uh, the international organizations for quite bold projects. Yeah. Uh, but those are going to take a lot of time. But our core market right now is in Europe. Uh, and we're focusing in uh, Germany um, within transport. So Deutsche Telekom, uh, interestingly enough, we're working with a few of their business units where they're becoming a, our initial distribution channel. So they're opening up doors for some of their clients. We started focusing on the transport, but with buses. So we've actually delivered a few uh, pilot projects, and now we're starting to have orders that are coming in. So we're in that situation. While we build other technology as well uh, in other markets, um, so within telco. So we're sitting, our office in Berlin is right in the middle of Deutsche Telekom's innovation lab. So there's, I think, about a thousand employees in that building. And every day I get to meet someone that does not know we exist. But once they do, they're happy to know us because they're trying to build similar technology. And uh, they're building the big boxes too. And we have something that is ready. And in fact, there was uh, discussions um, Telecom was actually building something very similar to uh, Ycaster, um, exact copy. Uh, uh, we met their team. They showed us what they had. We showed them ours. And then it's coming to an understanding that it doesn't make sense for them to continue building. They're, they're way behind. So we're trying to establish a partnership, a licensing deal, where they may rebrand our product for specific markets. Uh, and again, coming to the point that Armenia is great for development, but for sales outside the country, it's very difficult, at least for our type of product. So you have to be present in the location to be able to sell. OK, and uh, besides the actually these boxes and the hardware, do you give any service? Do you provide any service to the community? I try to help as much as I can. Um, okay. Um, I'm an entrepreneur that was very fortunate to have a lot of people that help, helped me, guided me. Uh, I was clueless as to the technology aspects of things, but very curious. Um, I kept on asking for help, and if you ask in the right way, it's hard to say no. So, um, and I see it today as well, people come to me and they ask for help, and I will help as much as I can, provided that I'm able to do my own things as well. 
but yeah, no, uh, I, I get involved locally. So recently, uh, with some of your partners of uh, Startup Grind, we um, started um, Founders Institute, the Yerevan chapter. And this is obviously something that will help the local entrepreneurs to meet uh, mentors internationally and uh, create the mindset to be able to build companies that are set for the international scene. And again, anything I can do for anyone, I will <coughs> gladly do. Uh, my time is limited, but obviously, you know, uh, so many people have helped me and I like to give back in the community. And I'm not the only one that does this in this community. And this is what I, uh, I didn't see this when we first came to Armenia, the first time for four days, but soon after we came and we were about to establish ourselves, we realized how one of the biggest strengths it is, is the tech community. And everyone helps each other um, they'll introduce to the right people, and that's the right mindset you need for an um, ecosystem to start and to grow. And finally, before the Q&A, if anyone has any question, uh, what will be your advice to our ecosystem, to our community, entrepreneurial community? Um, don't be scared, just do things. So it comes back to... Uh, I have uh, internally uh, my own philosophy of doing things. So one of them was do or do not, there is no try. So really attack, go for things. Don't be afraid to ask things from people. If you don't ask, you won't get. Um, I helped someone recently with the most, the silliest thing. She was asking me questions and she said, this person said, I can't do it, it's not gonna happen. And then I told her, well, just go see the person directly wait for them to come out of the office or just find a way to talk to them and, and it works. So just do things um, and surround yourself with smart people, um, really. There's a combination, as an entrepreneur, it's a very lonely space. Uh, it's scary at times, you, you feel sick, you get stressed. Um, you, you can't do this alone. So obviously try to have the right partners around you and then the right mentors or even the right people to talk. So I, I tell often people here, uh, if they're having issues, whatever it is, here's my number, call me. I'll either answer or I won't or I'll get back to you, etc. But reach out to people and you'll be surprised how people are there to help. Um, and my favorite passage, and this is, uh, I learned this from someone uh, Things are never as good or as bad as they look. So just go. You may be having the worst day. You may receive a lawsuit. You may receive a lot of things that are negative or even positive. But only when you look back, you realize, hmm, it wasn't that good or it wasn't that bad. So you never know what's going to happen. So I just tell you to go. And this person that taught me this was an entrepreneur. Um, that eventually uh, became very successful, became a VC, and he was telling me a story about the first company that they had started, and it was selling a lot, and tremendous business, etc. and suddenly he opens his, uh, an email, and it's a lawsuit, and they're being sued for $20 million. Uh, and, you know, uh, if I receive something like this, I'm gonna just go crazy. So the same thing happened to him, Oh my God, it's the end of the world, blah, 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 blah. So times, months of stress nonstop. But the interesting thing that happened is throughout this time, that company that sued them ended up buying them. So they found a way to work together and it made sense. So looking back, yeah, it was a very difficult situation to deal with. And I don't think there was any other way to deal with it. Um, but things are never as good or as bad as they seem. And believe me, um, it was not as bad. It wasn't as bad, <laughs> absolutely. Great, thank you very much. Armin Saidi. Thank you. If anyone has questions, you're more than welcome to do that now. You're welcome. Um, first of all, thank you very much. Um, it was interesting to hear about your experience and uh, taking into account the path that you've uh, had, that you've gone. I want to ask if you have a, a specific philosophy towards treating failure 
and big or failure? How do you, oh. how do you treat, do you have some you know, strategy or what would you um, advise with regards to entrepreneurs who are going to fail at a small or big scale? Thank you. Um, I don't think there's any real advice you can give to that is uh, you have to deal with whatever happens. So going back to, I think everyone will fail and you have to fail at a certain point. Uh, the only thing you have to learn from it that's important. So why did you fail? How can you avoid it next time? And the m second most important thing I think around that is um, don't let that stop you from doing anything else. Uh, throughout my career, uh, we talked about all the positive things that I've had, and I've had much more failures. I, I know how to make money, and I know how to lose money as well. So I, I, I'm good at both of them. So at the end, hopefully, one will be more than the other. Um, but you have to have a drive, and you have to be able to just learn from it and continue. And be careful. You, you have to strategize. You have to, you, you, you know, when you start something, um, you don't know where it's going to lead you, and you have the best of intentions, and maybe the timing is wrong, maybe situation in your life is wrong, maybe you weren't ready. So all these things have to come into play. Um, when I was doing vinyl back then, as an example, uh, before that launch, I had pitched to investors and I had no clue what I was doing. And it was just uh, failure after failure after failure. And then luckily things turned around where people were throwing money at us. And um, so that was very positive. But then when I started to look to raise funds for Winecaster, I was back at the same situation where I don't know what I'm doing and they don't understand what we're doing. So th there was a lot of learning curve and learning process in that. So it, it, it's a long process. Just don't give up. That's, that's the only thing I can say. And just reflect on, is this the right time? So for me, back then, uh, it wasn't the right time to raise money. I think somehow the investors, had I done with vinyl, there would have been some clause somewhere. I probably would have signed on the spot without having my own lawyers uh, <laughs> look at them and uh, disaster ahead. And again, thank you very much for this incredible talk. My pleasure, and thank you for listening to the story.